Hello, Hugh. Uh, I'm meeting with you. Hello, my, Lewis. <laughs> my name is Lewis Almeida. I lead the Spinoza and Gurdjieff study group. I live here in Santa Monica, California. And today, my guest is Hugh. And not only a guest, but he's a student. He's been a student with me for two and a half years. Uh, Hugh, where, where do you live? I live in Cornwall in uh, England. Okay. And uh, uh, how long have you been in this group on this or the art studies? So I've been with you now for, yeah, about two and a half years. Two and a half years. And when you came to me, uh, what was your interest? Why did, why did you want, uh, how did you, first of all, how did you find me again? So I found you just by looking on the internet and I'd come um, from Gurdjieff groups, but I wasn't satisfied with my progress where I was going with the Gurdjieff group. I was looking for something new to take me f further forward. Okay. And, and great. And, and uh, but how did you contact me? How did you find me? Um, I knew about Spinoza. So I think I put in search terms something like Gurdjieff and Spinoza. And I think that brought up a link to you. Uh, yes, excellent. Now, why, what, what did you, what do you want from me? What were you, what do you think you've learned so far and, and what were you searching for? So what I've learned is how much that I'm, I leave out my emotions. I, I, I'm, can very easily ignore the, my emotional side. And so what I realized that this was a, a lack in me and I wanted to develop this new side to my nature. So you, uh, Gurdjieff talks about that we have three centers. Uh, the uh, intellectual, the emotional, uh, and the uh, physical, or the moving part, or moving center. Now, we all have all three of these centers, the emotion, the intellectual, the emotional, and the physical, or moving center. And, uh, however, one is dominant. So in your case, your intellect was dominant center part of you. So you, what did you do? Uh, how did you earn a living? So I um, worked with, with computers on a kind of computer advice desk. Okay. And so that is very intellectual. And, um, and why, was, why the emotions were so important to you? Because there seemed to be something lacking in my life. It was rather flat. And okay. also, I'm a rather fearful person as well. Oh, what do you mean when you say fearful? Fearful of what? Fearful of other people. Other people. I don't know how they're going to react. So, and, and this is an excellent explanation or it's an example of how uh, intellectuals could be very successful in life, monetarily, materially, uh, be highly educated. Uh, and you've heard the story that uh, doctors have a, a, a poor bedside manner. Why is that? Why is that? It's because, you know, it takes a very high IQ intellect to be able to become a doctor. However, because they lack into it, uh, lack emotion, they're 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 not able to connect with their their, uh, their patients, and and so uh, uh, that is a, a, I would say a default or. Uh, uh, a problem in, in, in individuals, especially intellectuals who have, say, social anxiety, not be able to uh, connect with others. And you've been married with, how long have you been married now? I've been married 45 years. 40, 45 years. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and Susan, uh, we've, you've talked about Susan, she's more emotional. Yes. And uh, before you met me, uh, even the first year, how was your relationship with Susan? It was difficult. Things she'd say would annoy me very often. All right. And uh, so and you felt uh, you were, of course, superior because you were superior intellectual, superior intellectually. And Susan was very emotional. 
And uh, when she had problems, like she would be in the kitchen and, and she'll put uh, something on the stove to, for her lunch. And then she'll forget about it and it would burn. And she repeated this pattern quite often. And how did you feel about that? I was cross because I couldn't understand why she wasn't learning from her mistakes. You'd repeat the same mistake over and over again. Yes. And so what we do, uh, and what I recommend that uh, we do what's called journaling. And what is the journal process is to have a, a journal and uh, write the events that uh, trigger our emotions. See, uh, you was triggered. What do you, you, you said you use the word cross. What does cross mean? Cro cross is anger. <laughs> okay. I, was, I wasn't, uh, initially I wasn't happy with that word anger. Yes. Okay. And also, when I first when we first met, the first month or two, I asked you about hate. And what did you say to me about hate? Hate is bad. I don't hate. <laughs> hate is bad. I don't hate. And what do you have you learned about hate? Hate is a natural process that I need to get in touch with because it is in me. And what is the definition of by Espinoza? What? How does he define hate? Hate is pain associated with an external cause. Exactly. So with the journaling process is that we look at our desire. We want something. In your instance with Susan, uh, you would like her to pay attention to her cooking and not have it burn. Because the burning smells up the place and it ruins the food. She has to do it again. Uh, cooking. Uh, anyway, the idea is uh, to look at our emotions, how we are affected by the event. But what is our desire? You want Susan to pay attention. And when she doesn't, and she burns the uh, while she's cooking, uh, you feel pain because your desire is not met. You feel pain, and then hate is automatic. Hate is believing that Susan is the cause of your pain. And then from pain, we go into anger. What's the definition of anger? Spinoza's definition is ang anger is when we, um, we have, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Uh, anger, yeah. I'll put you in the spot. Anger is desire. We want something. Whereby through hatred, we are, say, induced or motivated to remove, destroy the object of our hate. So again, anger is desire, whereby through hatred, we are induced to remove or destroy the object of our hate. But in your case, intellectuals don't, aren't physical. You might, well, not all, that's kind of a, uh, that's not true, really. If you're highly intellectual, you may not like to be physical. So what you will do is shut down. And, and and walk away. That is how you express hate. Is that the way you expressed it? That's right. And and, and be silent. And, and be Silence silent. can last for hours. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes days. And even days, yeah. Yes. All right. Now, what is your relationship now with me, with Susan? It's been two and a half years with me. What is your relationship now? So it's but much better now. I accept Susan as she is and d just don't get into the states that I used to get into. And you feel you're, you're expressing your state of, of superiority or contempt is less? Yes, it's less because I recognize that Susan is acting in the only way possible she can act from her nature. And so do you believe she has free will or she does not have free will? So she doesn't have free will about how she reacts yeah. to things. She, she, she functions automatically, we all do. And this is a, a reality that I've learned through the study of Gurdjieff and Spinoza. And I wanna say something about Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff is an introduction of the work that uh, we're doing. Uh, Gurdjieff, uh, uh, Spensky wrote a book called In Search of the Miraculous, which I highly recommend. And uh, this is the book. You can find it on Amazon.com in search of the miraculous. 
And Ospensky was a student and he was, he documented everything. He did an excellent job. And one of the ideas that Virgil communicated was the idea that uh, there's a difference between knowledge and being. And so an individual can have great knowledge. They can become a professor, a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person, or teacher, whatever, and have that knowledge. But that knowledge does not change the individual. It's good to participate in life, and you might be very successful. But the same individual who is, who is highly intellectual, as you are, can have a, a, an attitude towards people, especially your spouse. Uh, an individual can come home and uh, be very successful as a doctor. They have a, a lot of respect, a lot of uh, uh, affirmation, and they might be adored. But they come home and they can't, they don't get along with the spouse or the children. Or they might be narcissistic uh, and antisocial. So individual, highly intellectual, does not have the strength to look at themselves. Uh, you know, we, we've heard of Socrates, uh, the important about Socrates, he talks about the idea to know thyself. Well, what is there to know? Uh, and the Stoics talk about the idea of the mind over matter, over the, uh, over the uh, emotions. Spinoza, and I'm not gonna talk about Spinoza. Spinoza talks about, he studied the Stoics, he studied Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, all, of, all the uh, individuals who he, he felt uh, uh, benefited, he benefited from all these uh, uh, past uh, philosophers, and he created his own. He was the only philosopher who valued the emotions. There's a whole part three of the ethics called the emotions. Now the ethics is this particular book, the ethics, and it includes the improvement of our understanding and the uh, commentaries. Now, both these books can be you know, purchased views on Amazon.com. Now, Spinoza says that it's possible to understand our emotions. And that's where I found so important. So to change our character from just having knowledge and to in increase the power of our being, we must have knowledge of oneself. So when you begin to factualize, and what does that factualize? Is to acknowledge the, the painful situation and what was our desire, what do we want, and what was the situation that that that, that causes pain, which we believe the cause of our, our pain. But we must acknowledge it. What is the definition of pain again, you? Pain is the transition of a person from a greater to a lesser state of perfection, in Spinoza's what? words. Yes, and what does that mean? What do you mean by less perfection? A feeling of being of not knowing what to do, of helplessness, of yes, of being rather lost. Being lost, a feeling of helplessness, and also not knowing what to do, and a feeling of powerlessness. So less perfection means less power. What does that mean? Uh, perfection and reality to Spinoza is syn are synonymous. Perfection includes power, meaning if we lack, if we are perfection is reduced, we lack power. Lacking power in handling the problem. Lacking, so when we are in an emotion of pain, at that moment, we don't know how to deal with the problem. So we go into hate. Hate is saying, Susan is the cause of my pain. And then we go to anger and we give her the silent, silent treatment and don't talk to her for, to her for a few days or a few hours. But we don't solve the problem. So when we begin to factualize, uh, a miracle happens. What is a miracle? It helps us as you write the journal, you're going to, you're beginning to explore uh, your nature. And this exploration triggers or say accesses the higher intelligence because the ego personality doesn't want to change. It relies on memory and is satisfied with the status quo. It, it, it The way it deals with its problem, it goes to hate and to anger. And that's what, and so anger is just saying, I want to solve the problem, but it really doesn't. It causes more problems. And so for many years, Susan uh, resented you 
for your attitude towards her. But what has changed? What is her attitude towards you now? She is much more affectionate with me. Um, she, and what is it? Yes. 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 More affectionate. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. seem to get on much better. We're getting on much better. And she wants more mm. intimacy from you. Because yeah. why? Because you have changed. No longer are you walking around in a superior way and a contemptuous way, but you're you're, you're more relaxed. You're more, say, accepting. But you're more acknowledging, you have more understanding. So I think the understanding is where you're you're going. It's just not accepting, but we understand and then we can accept the reality. <coughs> There's another book called How to Solve Life's Problems. Uh, this book, uh, I published it. I, my teacher actually wrote it, and I saw the value in it. I, I want us to, would you read something from this book? Right. I, I, I want you to read uh, chapter seven. Let's look at chapter seven on page 14 in this book. Okay, discriminating between your intelligence and memory. Are you becoming aware that almost everything you do is based on responses of memory patterns to present problems, situations, circumstances, and the like? We are all programmed early in life with different patterns that become embedded in our memory banks. The result is that almost all of our mature existence has been predetermined so that instead of living spontaneously in the now, we are responding mindlessly, that is, without consciousness to various external stimuli. But because we are unaware of these deeply rooted patterns in our memory, we are under the illusion that we make choices at free will. When you begin, dim dimly at first, to recognize the great difference between your intelligence and your memory, your intelligence will slowly and gradually become activated so that you will be able to begin responding to problems and circumstances by asking yourself real questions, by asking yourself, what do I think about this now? You're not merely responding from preset patterns. You will consult your memory and use it as a tool and then make decisions based on the best thinking you can do now. The consulting of your intelligence will slowly strengthen it and you will enter on the training path needed to discriminate between your dynamic intelligence and your passive memory. Then a process of growth will begin in your intelligence. In time, you will discover yourself becoming more alive and you will experience a new kind of joy based not on externally produced sensations, but on the inner sense that you're really on the path of true self-fulfillment. Thank you, excellent. Now, I want to uh, go over this, some of these ideas. Are you becoming aware that almost everything you do is based on responses of memory patterns to present, pro to present problems, situations, circumstances, and the like? You know, we're not aware of this. So we're just automatic and we respond automatically without really thinking. It's like a, a gut reflex. We react. And so what this work is wants us to do is begin to, as during the fractalizing process, is to, at the end of the day, you can't do it with, when you are in emotion at that moment, when you're reacting, but by the end of the day, to see what was the situation that caused you to react. And so what we're doing here as my teacher says, we're, we begin to see how we are programmed. We're all programmed early in life with different patterns that become embedded in our memory banks. So we act from memory, not from our true intelligence. Now, he says, the result is almost all of our mature existence has been predetermined. So instead of living spontaneously in the now, we are responding mindlessly. And look at all the situations, you know, uh, People wonder, well, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why are we suffering? Why are we in pain? We have problems. We're lonely. What do we do 
uh, with, with loneliness. If we have social anxiety, what do we do with that? Or we are quick to anger. Uh, we might anger at the slightest uh, uh, feeling rejection, uh, not getting the job done, feeling like a failure. And so what do we do with our anger? What do we do with our hate? What do we do with our pain? We just uh, cover it over. As Gurdjieff would say, we buffer the feelings and not pay attention to it. And we don't because we're operating from our memory to try to solve the situation and we do a very poor job. <laughs> now, the idea says, the next idea is that because we are unaware of these deeply rooted patterns in our memory, we are under the illusion that we are make choices out of free will. And I would say that the biggest problem that most individuals are going to reject what we're doing is the belief that they have free will, that they have free choice. And this is the greatest obstacle to growth and uh, to look at oneself or to look at the reality of what is happening because you're born into that belief that we have free will. When you see somebody, uh, you disapprove of what they're doing, you automatically have believed they have free will. I was watching a video today about uh, a, a, a man who happens to be black. He's in a house inspector, inspecting a house. He was doing a job, doing an inspection because the owner uh, was selling his home and, they, and the buyer needed an inspection to find out the condition of the house. Now, however, a neighbor saw this black man and called the police and said, this man looks suspicious. And so the policeman began to question this individual, this inspector. And the inspector says, uh, I have the right. You want my identification. Why should I give you my ID? Have I committed a crime? So the inspector was very intelligent and knew his, his rights. However, the police uh, uh, officer insisted wanting the, uh, the purpose why he was there. He, they wanted his identification and so forth. And the inspector, the individual says, no, I know my rights. And when I began to see this, I had a reaction automatically, saying, thinking my action was pain, hate, and anger. Why? Because I believe in free will at that moment. Because I realized that this police was not acting properly. Believe in a neighbor without even question. And the idea that all black people are criminals, that they're out there to rob the neighborhood. So this offends me. And so I automatically feel pain, hate, and anger. But I understand as I reflect upon it automatically, I began to think it, now think in a higher way. There's no free will. Police does not have free will. The inspector does not have free will, free will and I have no free will. So this is what we must understand that the causes of our emotions happens because we believe we have free will. Now, right now, uh, you, uh, Hugh, just received a cup of tea from Susan. That's right, yes. <laughs> Isn't that nice? So when we get back to this, I want to just enter, uh, review this chapter seven. And there are over, there's about 42 chapters in here. This book, it's a small book. There was only about 80, uh, uh, 86 pages. It's called How to Solve Life's Problems. It's available on Amazon.com. And uh, again, I publish it. I do get a, a small, uh, small amount of it. I don't make, I don't benefit from the books I sell because there's, there's not that much, many purchases. But for my students, it's required reading. So if you want to grow, you want to change, it's, it's possible. However, uh, you might be interested in, in joining us in the future. You may want to do what Hugh is doing, becoming a student. And for those students who are, are former students, you may want to come back uh, in spite of the fact that we have a disagreement. I'm always, I don't stay in the past. I'm always looking for students or past or former students to continue this work because this work is so dynamic, it changes lives. I've been doing this for over 50 years and I continue to grow because my growth is able to help you and others 
how to understand Spinoza and Gurdjieff to learn how to live from their ideas because it's it's mind changing. And the last part, he says that this. When you begin dimly at first to recognize the great difference between your intelligence and your memory, your intelligence will slowly and gradually become activated. But you must realize it's there. This higher level of consciousness uh, activity, intelligence, is where true consciousness resides. You're conscious of yourself and you're conscious of the whole of nature or God, Spinoza's God. All right, thank you, Hugh. For, for participating and we'll do more of this. Thank you. And, and, and I'll say goodbye. Okay, bye Lewis. And thank you Hugh.